All right, my friends. Happy early 4th of July to everybody watching. We've got James Larson in the house. We're going to be talking about what possibly is one of the best values in subwoofers at under $500, the RSL Speedwoofer 10S Mark II. We've done the uh, review of the original 10S probably four or five years ago, and now they've done an update to that subwoofer. And I wanted James Larson to take a look at it, to do measurements on it, and to compare it from the older model, which was a very good model at the time, to what they've done now to see what kind of enhancements they've made. How's it going, James? It's going well. Awesome, man. Well, I'm glad that you had the chance to check out a subwoofer that is both affordable and something easy to, for you to manage to move around and not have to break your back to move it uh, to your theater room or to test it outside like you normally do with our speakers and subwoofers. Yeah, it was a nice break from the norm. <laughs> it's giving my back a break. Yeah. Now, you, um, when they sent you out to you, did they send you speakers as well, or did they just send you the subwoofer and you strictly looked at their subwoofer, not their satellites? I ju they just sent me their sub. I mean, I, I've had uh, the original 10S before, so I know what that does. You know, I, I, I tested that one. So, like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, we've reviewed their speakers before. I've tested their um, CG5, CG25, CG23s. So, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with their products. Yeah, you are pretty familiar. And, you know, we're happy uh, working with a company like that because they're a family owned business. They've been around for quite some time. I think like they started out in the late 70s and then they took a break for a period of time and now they're back and uh, they've been coming back really strong with these great products, affordable down to earth products. You know, they don't break the bank and they're not too big as well. So they're easy to fit for people that want uh, products with high wife acceptance factor. So I'm going to share the screen here. And, and before I do that, I just want you guys to know if you're interested in seeing all the details on this product on the audioholics.com editorial site right now, James Larson's written review is there. It's exhaustive. He's got a barrage of measurements on there. He's got listening tests. So if you want to just kind of, after you watch this video, go check out the review. I'll put a link down below. And if you are looking at the actual review on the editorial site, I'll embed this video as well. So you'll have both sets of data here for you to examine to determine if this is the right subwoofer for your needs. So I'm gonna share the screen now with this PowerPoint presentation. Now, if you're a patron, um, this is on our patreon.com slash audioholics. If you wanna follow along, please feel free to download it there. And we got a little comment here. Yes, Howard and Joe are some of the nicest guys around. They really are. Love the, love the brand and I'm glad to see that they're they're still continuing to produce high quality product. James, this is the 10S Mark II. I don't see aesthetically how it looks much different from its predecessor. It's not really that different. The only difference would be the um, on the original, the slot port it was a slot part itself before the slot port was on the front of the sub. Now it's right. um, being repositioned to the rear. So other than that, you really wouldn't know the difference. So. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Okay, so this is a reasonable size sub. It's a what is it like a fifteen inch cube? I think. Yeah, it's about approximately a fifteen inch cube. It's it's not a big one. I mean, there's smaller subs for sure, but this is very um reasonably sized. Right. So like anyone can like, you know, it should be able to fit in most most situations, you know, or setups or whatever, you know. Yep. So just to recap on the specs here for you guys, it's a 10 inch driver, 400 watt amp. So the amp power is up a little bit from its predecessor and it's 15 inch cube. It weighs about 40 pounds and it's got high level. Does it just have high level inputs? It doesn't have uh it doesn't have uh, speaker level inputs, right? It does have speaker level inputs. Oh, it does. Okay. Yeah. That's one of the, you know, that's not very common I mean, anymore, yeah. but you know, here and there you see them, but this one definitely has that. So. Well, that's cool for people that have like two channel uh, integrated amps or receivers and then have an RCA output and you can plug this in speaker level and um, and still have subwoofer for two channels. So that's that's a good feature to have a lot. Of, like you said, a lot of subs just don't have that anymore. Yeah. Oh, here, here's what. OK, it comes in two finishes um, on the left. Um, is the white and that probably doesn't come off too well against a white background, but yeah. you can have it in white. And uh, I've got the map. No, matte black one or whatever they, they call that finish it's like more like a textured black matte right. finish and um but um you know you can get it in white if you have like a really bright decor and you don't want 
just a black box drawing attention and both are the same price right there's no difference in price for finish options i believe so i believe yeah. so but i don't i'm not 100 percent sure off the top of my head but yeah so okay here's a slide that kind of like shows the um what kind of separates rsl's products and their subwoofers um from others and it's their compression guide technology and so more subwoofers just have a uh you know an internal chamber and then the port or if not a port, it's sealed, or maybe a passive radiator, which is a lot like a port. But um, RSL separates their chamber, their the internal like uh, chamber into two different chambers. Like there's two separate chambers. This happens in their speakers too, and then they have this really narrow slot port. And they do this. I've never fully understood the benefits of this. They say it's to like address resonances or something, mm -hmm. but they do it and. Um, the products are fine, so like I, it works in the sub. The sub is fine; it's good. So like, you'll have to like you'll have to talk to them about the benefits of this. But one ben one side benefit of this is that it the this is like a side view, and it adds uh, a bracing to the cabinet. So it's a it's a pretty well braced cabinet, and so like um. But that's that's what dif differentiates the sub from others is the compression guide technology, and um, it's there <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know how well it actually works i think I don't, i'm not sure how how different it would be from a conventional port of design well it's it, not hurting anything right you don't hear any weird noises coming out of it do you I, no i don't think so i don't think so um the slot port is awfully narrow it, you yeah. might get into chuffing a little earlier than if you had just a, a cylindrical port but i don't know yeah you'd have to ask them I, i've asked them and it's it's just something that's you know they they go into a little bit in their website but they don't go into a very deep detail but anyways this is what kind of separates their subs from others i gotcha so it's a very sexy looking driver especially at this price usually you get stamp basket drivers you don't get a driver this beefy and this this is a cast basket right yeah it's cast aluminum nice double stack motor it's vented through the pole piece vented and, yeah and the uh under the spider so it's it's a it's kind of really a firm um, cone too. It's a really durable, like serious cone. So like um, the dust cap is one of those that separate that, that covers the entire you know cone. And so yeah. it's just it's a beefy driver. It's it's better than what you'd expect at this price point. I think its competitors are probably not don't have a a, a driver quite on this level of, of build quality. But yeah, it's serious. It's it's a good ten. You know to. Yeah, that, a, that's a nice half roll surround. That's a really beefy surround too, you know, for, for this price point. I mean, yeah, it's like, a, it's more than what you'd expect for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like it's got some heft to it. So here's the back panel. Let me show uh, a little bit closer look. You're right. It does have speaker level inputs and line level inputs. It has line no level back. outputs too. So and outputs, yeah, no XLRs, but that's, that's fine. At yeah, you're never going to find XLRs on this price point. So, yep. And yeah, there's a slot port. It's a very narrow and like wide uh, slot port, and like so that is really narrow. Yeah, I mean, it's I think it's probably better in the back of the sub than in the front. I think that was probably an improvement, but we'll we'll get into that a little when when we dig in the uh, performance of the sub. But yeah, it's like it's got the basic feature set, um, and and the it has a, the high pass. The high pass. I mean, the low pass filter actually activates the different modes. So if you set it all the way to the um the right you hear a click and it sw switches off the um the low pass filter and it you know it goes full range as full range as it can and it turns on something called movie mode that grants you an extent additional extension and um that's what you want to use for, for for an lfe input and but if you don't have lfe put then you can set the um low pass to whatever you you know you want or whatever your situation requires so so lfe input bypasses its own base management so you use your own base management in your avr yeah and that, that, that's what you do anyway so it's like yeah most most companies have a switch that that do that but not this one and that makes perfect sense you know so like yeah um it's it's uh but but for this subwoofer i mean as we'll see in the measurements you should probably just leave an lfe there's no reason why You'd so that 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 third switch, that third knob, is that a variable phase? I think so. I think it's uh the third no the third switch. I think I can't see switch, the, the, <laughs> one the of them. Knob. I think is a variable phase. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, one of them is, and uh, that that switch above the LFVs, I believe that's for the wireless connection. So like, yeah, the phase is variable. I mean, yeah. So like, yeah, it has variable phase. I think that's the second one down, but I I I don't see this. The picture doesn't. It's not. Yeah, it looks like variable screen, phase, and, and if that's the case, uh, that's awesome. I think that's a very useful tool, and you don't see that usually in budget subs. So that's kudos to RSL for that. It just helps you with better integration if you're, you know, if as opposed to just a zero 180 to have that variability to maybe go to 100 or 90 or something like that to get better integration at the crossover. It's good. It's a good thing to have. Yeah. So here we are now, James, taking the subwoofer outside to measure it. And the reason why I know there's people that are probably newbies here. The reason why James measures the subwoofer outside is it takes the influence of the room away and you're just measuring the performance of the subwoofer. It's not that we're listening to the subwoofer outside. We're doing the measurements outside to give you accurate measurements for every subwoofer we test under the same test conditions. And then he plots his graphs and he shows you his SPL numbers and CEA 2010 numbers and all that stuff. Very consistent way of testing a subwoofer. This is called a ground plane technique. Yeah, here's uh, the the conditions in order to measure the sub. You have to get at least 100 feet from any large structure to eliminate the reflections, or else you can't really judge the sub what it's doing on its own. You know, you're getting you're judging the environment. You know, the more their environment gets in your measurements, the more their environment is what you're measuring rather than the sub itself. So we have yeah. to go out to this wide open area, and it's not easy to find a place like this. But I have one, so. That's that's nice. Um, there's a lot of criteria for the the test that I do for the environment. Okay, here's a here's a graph of the responses for the modes. Uh, the red the red um, curve is for the LFE mode, and you can mm -hmm. see if you turn that off and if you use the um, the low pass filter mode or what they call the music mode, it actually you lose some extension. So almost everybody should be using the LFE mode. You know, and I don't, almost everybody will be. But if you yeah. don't use that mode, then you lose that extension. See, you, I mean, the music mode goes down to about 100, about 30 hertz before it starts rolling off. But the LFE mode gives you significantly more. Um, yeah, you're flat to almost 25 hertz on there. Yeah, I mean, not quite 25, but you're getting there. And um, it gives you, you know, uh, significantly more, more extension. So, like, use the LFE mode on this on the subwoofer if you want D-Bass. If you don't, then, <laughs> yeah, these the mo music mode. And I show you the what the the um high the low pass filter does for the like, maximum setting of 200 hertz and 80 hertz where 200 is the green obviously and 80 is the blue so right. this is, shows you the performance you get a nice flat response overall from like you know 30 to 80 and um, definitely it definitely looks like this sub has been eq'd now the amplifier itself has dsp in it right oh absolutely there's equalization going on yes yeah there is i mean almost all subs have that so yeah, very so, linear response there for sure. Sure, yeah, it's it's a good flat response. It's a, it's, you know, but it, most subs are. It, it's hard. You won't find a sub that's like that has a crazy response that just doesn't happen anymore. Maybe on a really really low budget like home theater in a box sub, but not not a four hundred dollar sub. <laughs> you know, they're all going to have flat, flat responses. So this chart shows what happens as you turn the volume up. So I mean, the lo lowest curve there is like a nominal response at ninety dB. And um, this is reference to 90 dB at 50 hertz. And then I turn it up by five decibels and record the, the response until there's just no more output left, right? And so you can see it, it does compress the low frequencies at, at like when you really crank it, right? Yeah, it holds over 100 a, something dB. Right? Yeah, it holds its shape up to like 100 and over 100. It's just compressing the low end, but you still have quite a bit of um, like mid bass above 50 hertz. And so, it's this is a pretty good showing, especially for a um, four hundred a small four hundred and fifty dollar sub. This is a very good, yeah, this is a, a, a excellent uh, measurement set. I mean, here, here's the burst tests. Um, this this just records the output, like like in a moment what it can do for a transient, you know, like a maybe like a drum, a kick kick drum hit or something mm -hmm. like that, right? And this um, this is a very good uh, measurement set. Um, you know, one, one thing I should note about the sub, one of the impressive um, aspects of it was that, especially for the long-term output, this doesn't crop up in the short term, but for the long-term output, when you really just throttle it, when you give it the full bore, you know, the volume is turned all the way up and I'm, I'm sending in a big signal, um, 
this album really uh, holds its composure so it doesn't overdrive. There is no, there is no like uh, driver bottoming out or weird noises, right? The DSP yeah. limiters, it, it really keeps the driver in check so that it doesn't just overdrive and it doesn't really make any really obnoxious not sounds at all. So the distortion, well, you do see some distortion here. It's not all that audible. And the, the, and, and that's probably the biggest difference between the, the first generation um, 10S and the second generation is that this, the DSP really keeps a tight leash on the, on the driver. And it, so it doesn't, it doesn't make any, um, you know, unintended noises, you know, distortion. I mean, there's mm -hmm. distortion, but it's not bad. And so that the sub never, it never uh, went left, went out of control. And so like, that's, right. so that's what, that's one of the big differences of this one. This is a good measurement set for, for this, for a small sub. Like I said, for at this price point, this is a very, very good measurement set. And to keep things into perspective, because I was looking at our CEA data. And by the way, if you're a patron, I have the Excel spreadsheets of all of our subwoofer measurements ever from the dawn of time since we started Audioholics. It's on our patreon.com slash audioholics if you want to compare all the different subs. But I was looking at this price class. Um, you have the SVS, obviously the SB1000 Pro, which is the sealed, a little bit smaller than this. And then the PB1000 Pro, which is the ported version, which is a bigger, much bigger box. Both have 12 inch drivers in them. The uh, SB1000 is about the same price as this. It's might maybe a 50 bucks more, but I then the P- Isn't it like uh, 600 or am I wrong? Yeah, you're right, you're right. They raised the price. So it is, the SVS is a more expensive sub, but to put things in perspective, the RSL Speedwoofer 10S Mark II actually has more output than the SB1000 Pro but less output than the larger PB1000 Pro. So if you're on the fence between an SB1000 and a PB1000, this is like the bridge gap product between those two subs, in my opinion. Kind, I, I would somewhat agree, but like the, the SBS, the SB1000 Pro is a, a small sealed sub. And so what this has over that is make, make basic, more just deep bass. Yeah. So like it doesn't have the advantage of a port. It's all on that driver. But what that does have over this is a bit more mid bass output. So for, with that, you're you're spending more, you're getting more mid bass output, but you are giving up more deep bass output because of the the, the size advantage and the port advantage. Yeah, um, I so kind of like, think that's a good compromise. And you know, with the price savings you're getting on these, you can start looking at getting possibly two of them in your theater room. Obviously. Yeah, it would be that would be a good uh, yeah two of these. I mean, one is pretty beefy too. Yeah, it would be yeah. a good system for sure. Here's what are we looking this. at here? This is um the harmonic distortion. So for those for that com long term compression sweeps that you saw before, the kind of bluish graphs, this is the corresponding distortion that that how it rose with level, right? And this is like kind of a three D view of that to give you an idea of how they kind of compared with each other. Um, it, it's pretty good. I mean, the the first sweep there, that lowest level. I guess you can go to the next slide to get a, a additional view of this. So that's the nominal level, that, that like light brown, like block in front there, the the first sweep. That's that's like what this sub is doing at, at nominal levels, like what mm -hmm. you normally drive it at. And there's almost no distortion down to 20 hertz, right? So all it's basically above five, uh, below five five percent THD, below uh, I mean above 20 hertz, you know. But I mean this sub isn't really geared for super deep bass, so you know it's not not really doing much. So yeah, there's distortion below 20 hertz but there's no output so there's nothing there right there's nothing there should bother you but when you start to crank it yeah you can get distortion but like the, the uh, upper graphs above that point are just it, it's it's pushing sub pretty hard and you can can get distortion from it it does keep it about um below 20 percent thd that's at, good at the highest the, the highest yeah. absolute maximum what the sub can do right very few people would ever hit drive the sub that hard but at nominal levels the real takeaway is at nominal levels, this is a very, very clean sub. You can drive it hard and it can produce some distortion, but the, the sub never loses control of itself and it doesn't bottom out. It doesn't like, it doesn't. Um, doesn't misbehave. Yeah, it, does, it, it doesn't just go crazy. Doesn't, like some yeah. subs do, some subs do, and this one doesn't, even though it can, it can make distortion at the highest drive levels, you know, but most subs do, some subs don't when they have a really tight limiter, you know. This one doesn't right. have the tightest limiter, but it does save itself from, you know, self-destruction basically. So this this is the group delay. 
uh, like this is basically a, a graph of the time domain behavior. This um, this was done in the LFE mode right here because most people are going to use LFE mode. You can bring this down a bit if you go into music mode, but nobody is going to be using it. Realistically, very few people are going to be using it in music mode. You should be using the sub in LFE mode. And um, it's a ported. This is a ported, typical reported response where it's, it's very low at like mid bass. And then as you get into port generated output and, and around like from 30 to 20 hertz, that it, it does start to lag. The, the port output is not quite an. It's 180 degrees out of phase with the, or it's 360 degrees out of phase with the um, um, driver's motion. So there is a cycle of delay there, and that's this is very typical for a ported subwoofer. But it's not it's not it's not bad. It's just it's not anywhere or, or like worse than average. It's just it's not better than average. It's about what you'd expect. You know, it's 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 decent. It's very good, and there's there's not much, much audible like group delay or time domain problems with the sub it's it's a uh, good uh i don't know what you get. it not, shouldn't be a sloppy loose sounding sub exactly, like yeah, some people complain it's not a about. boomy sloppy yeah, sub it's still, it has good musicality based on this measurement yeah um, somebody's asking in the chat if this has a trigger on and off on the sub i would assume it has an auto on sense circuit right i think it has auto on but it doesn't have like a 12 v doesn't trigger. have a 12 volt trigger right no that's not uh, not okay. this one no yeah i mean i don't i never use 12 volt triggers on subs personally but i don't either but i mean it has to use this is this is an um, interesting graph um i thought i'd just throw this in there this is not in the review but this is kind of a shows you the challenge of testing subs like this theoretically deep base is omnidirectional in reality it isn't it, it you know the 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 where the sub is facing makes a difference in how you know the 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 output is recorded and so the the red curve here like the graph says is if i had the mic facing the cone at one meter you get the red curve you, you get more mid bass but you lose deep bass and the the dark green curve is what happens if you have the port which is um rear mounted on the sub if you have that facing the microphone yeah and it, you lose a lot of you. You get more deep bass, and but you lose the mid bass output of the cone. So, um, I think for this, so what I did is I, for the CEA measurements, um, I took the I, I tested it with both the port facing and driver facing, and I took the highest output scores and and used that to make the chart because that's what the sub is actually doing, right? If I yeah. just did one or the other, wouldn't fairly portray the sub's performance. And and uh, the light green curve on this is what happens if I just have the side of the sub facing the mic at two meters. And the more you pull the mic back from from uh, subwoofers, the more you get, the less of a difference the ratio of the like the transducer surface um, makes on um, the mics. You know the, the, those effects aren't as much in the mic. So if it's tricky really because it's tricky because it's hard to get equal path differences between the ports and the drivers on some of these subs when the when the ports on the back of the subwoofer and the drivers on the front right it's just the mic difference between the di the distance between the port and the sub driver itself is what could create some of these frequency response variations it, it is and and the, the, so if you want to get the most accurate recording of the sub you have to pull the mic way back from a sub like this like then if you increase I, the noise floor yeah, that's and that's a problem. You you increase the noise floor, so like, you have to like just kind of like know what to do, <laughs> right? Just just put the mic where you have the fairest representation of the sub's performance. And um, so I think for the for like the compression sweeps, I just put the mic like maybe diagonal to the driver, and that's where I thought you, I would get the best compromise of of um output from the driver and output from the port. So that's um. So th these are kind of some of the tricks and some of the problems of measuring subs. You know, it, it's not it's not as simple as just putting a mic in front of the sub and like you know recording a sweep. There's a, there's complications, especially for a sub where the the radiating radiating points of the sub are not on a single point, like say yeah. like the sealed subwoofer, right? That's that's easy, right? But for this. But remember that Aaron doll 1723 that had like a slot port on the back and two drivers on the sides, right? Yeah. I, pull, I pulled the mic to get CEH measurements from that. I pulled the mic back to eight meters. <laughs> so, Damn. 
Yeah. And, but so I, I just want to clarify this to someone's asking, does the curve say that the port should be cone facing? No, it doesn't say that at all. No. It just says that it's tricky to do an accurate measurement when you've got radiating area and porting areas in different locations of the cab that it's hard to get equal distance to the mic. And that's why James is showing these different frequency response variations, depending on how you measure the subwoofer. Sure. The, the, this is a problem for outdoor testing, for anechoic yeah. testing conditions. In, in room, right, all this output will bounce back in the room, right? So it's, 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 it is very much an omnidirectional device in room. And, and so all this is sum up on your listening position, but outdoors. Outdoors mm, tricky. Yep. Yeah. And actually, I, I do like the idea of the rear facing port for two reasons. One, and you'll probably talk a little bit more about this, is it acts as a uh, low pass filter. So you may not hear as much port noise because now it's behind the cabinet itself. And two is I think it loads the base in the room slightly differently when you have um, the port at the back versus the driver in the front, as opposed to having everything in the front. It's just the way it, it potentially can increase the modal density and how it loads into that corner. So, I mean, that's just some of the best subs I've seen, the way they load into the room are ones that have the ports in the back and, and drivers up front or having a combination of, of drivers front and back. Yeah, I mean, it's it's... That's, I think it's an improvement over the Mark One design, where they they put the the port on back. Um, it, yeah, you're exactly right. Um, that it just it, it's an improvement, and you, it masks port noise. And um, if there are if there is any port noise, and it, and it helps it, the, the closer you put like bass producing like like points of acoustic emission closer to a surface, right? The more low does that yeah that, that output, and so like it just helps it, and it doesn't hurt in, in room. You know, so okay. The, I guess we, we sum it up here in this um, slide with the, the pros and the cons. All right, this is a, it's pros. Here's a four hundred and fifty dollars sub that has uh, with shipping. Yeah, with shipping, that has a frequency response well below thirty hertz. And that's really good for that price point. And it's very good head headroom, especially for the size. It, it's it's a small sub and it, it doesn't look bad at all. Right, it's just a little inoffensive box. You know. So it's that's good. That's good. The one, one, like I said before, the the drive the DSP really protects the driver. It protects it from being overdriven. It also protects it against against a bunch of other like like fault conditions, like bad like input voltage from the their, their wall outlet, right, or weird signals like a DC offset, right. The DSP protects us against all of that. And so that's a big improvement over the Mark One version, which only had a an analog amplifier with no DSP in it. The, the build quality is good. It's a solid little sub. Um, and like like we said before, free shipping. You get a 30-day trial. You can return it. They will, print, they will repay for return shipping too. But I think they, they want a $25 restocking fee. But it's, you know, here's a little sub, a $450 sub, and you can just try it out for basically $25 if you want yeah, to return it for any reason, very, right? Yeah. That's a very good deal right there, let me tell yeah. you. And, and for the cons, I would say... It kind of has sharp corners, so you don't want to hit your shins on this thing. But there, it's just at the right height where you would hit your shins if you weren't watching where you were walking, right? And if they rounded those edges, it might take the the edge off that blow, right? <laughs> so like it's it's a small con. If they did round the edges, they'd probably have to raise the cost of this. Oh yeah, so, yeah I mean, radius not, edges definitely cost more money. It's a small nitpick. It's a small nit. So I'm not gonna, you know, it's it's just a small thing that. It, Whatever. Well, right. Just make sure you don't have any like running kids around the house that can potentially, you know, trip and fall and hit a corner or something. Yeah, like put that. put it somewhere out of the way, you know. Yeah. But that's true for like a lot of audio products and so. It's... So I argue that for four hundred and fifty dollars shipped, this is really like a four hundred dollars sub when you think about it because fifty dollars for shipping. But anyway, let's just say for four hundred and fifty dollars, I argue this is probably the best or one of the best subwoofer values on the market. I know you're like, well, I want to check out the BIC PL300 and the Polk HTS-12, and we will definitely check those out. But I'm just, right now, until we see those other two subs, this is really the contender. I mean, we have a track record with the original 10S. It's been a really good performer. I've had a ton of people email me telling me that they put two of these subs in their theater room and they were blown away. They've really enjoyed the subwoofer so now the fact that they've improved upon it they put a dsp driven amp with a really smart limiter to make sure that you just can't overdrive the sub as easily 
They did some performance tweaks on it. They put a little bit more power. Um, it's a hell of a deal. And I just want to show people what it looks like with and without the grill. Here it is again. And you said this is like a Kevlar reinforced paper driver. Did I? <laughs> I don't remember. I, I guess I did in the review. I, I, James, I, I, you I, review I, these products. You should know these products better than me. I, you know, I review so many things and I go over so many different types of drivers and cones and surface materials for everything. I can't remember. I can't. It's in the review, right? I double checked it. It's in the review. So it's it might in be. The review. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it what? might be. I, I, it sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. It's a two inch copper voice call, an anodized aluminum dust cap. And okay. I think it's, I believe it's a Kevlar reinforced. And I hope I don't eat my hat on that, but. That's what I thought I read. But anyways, it looks like a cool driver. And here it is with the grill on it. So it looks a little more rounded, I guess, with the grill on. It does because the grill does add some rounding, but I think it looks cooler with the, it's such, it, you know, with the grill on, it's just a black box, right? With the cone out, it looks a little bit more interesting. So like whatever, if you don't want to see a cone, some people for some reason don't like to look at cones, right? Oh, so Ryan is saying it's an aluminum driver. So maybe I was reading a different review of yours. I don't know. It looks aluminum to me. It looks like black anodized aluminum, but it's, it's in the review. I mean, I, I'm, yeah. I'm sure it's, I got correct there, but I don't remember, you know, I haven't, haven't had the sub. I returned the sub like a month ago. So like, I don't remember, remember all the details of this one. So like, it's in the review. So you, you can double check there. That, I'm sure yep. that's correct. Yep. Well, guys, we've, um, We've been covering RSL for quite some time now, and and I just can't say anything bad about the company. They're nice people, um, American-owned company, family-owned company. Definitely check it out. We've got a comment here from an owner. I've had one for four years, the 10S Mark I. Have no intention of replacing it. Best money I've ever spent on audio gear. The only one subwoofer upgrade I consider is adding another one. Yes. And that's the great thing about a subwoofer like this. So the 10S and the 10S Mark II, on their own, just a single sub in your room. It's good for about 3,000 cubic feet. It's, it gets our Basaholic medium room size rating. It's at the high end of the medium room size rating. So if you double up and you add two of these subs, even if they're not co-located, we almost never tell you to put, to put both subs in the same location. We want to get the get those subwoofers spread out in the, in the room to get good uh, room distribution of the room modes and smooth out the bass response. You'll get a little extra gain by having those two subs, even though they're not co-located, especially below 30 hertz. This will get you that large basaholic room size rating, and it'll still be under a thousand bucks for two subs. So you'll have the benefit of multi-subs. So you have every seat has consistently good bass, and you've got that large basaholic room size rating if you have two of these subs, and it's under a thousand bucks. And then they have a wireless transmitter you could add. I think it's like another 50 or 60 bucks. So if you can't put a cable in one location, you could do a wireless adapter and it works pretty well. I've, I've had a lot of people say they've added this to their systems because they wanted to add a second sub and they couldn't run a uh, line level connection and they've had good results with it. So that's something cons to consider. The only thing the sub doesn't have is it doesn't have an app. It doesn't have um, you know any type of room correction system. I don't even think it has a PEQ, right? I mean, you can't go and adjust so all of that stuff really at the end of the day should be done in your processor. I mean, the SVS advantage is it does have the phone app and it does have the ability to do PEQ. It's nice to have that, but it's not a showstopper because most of the time we have room correction or we have PEQ filters built into our AV processors, or you get a mini DSP. You get a mini DSP and now you can control the phase, the delays, you know, the PEQ function for each sub. So you've got options out there. And, and for the price, I think this is a really good compromise. They're giving you the performance as opposed to all the features and a generous return policy. So it's just kind of a no-brainer if you're in the market for an entry-level kind of price point of a subwoofer and you don't want something too big. This is one of your top contenders. It's the RSL Speedwoofer 10S Mark II. Now, James, do you have anything else to add to this um, listening experience? I know you talked about the listening and your reviews. You seem to like it. You didn't seem to really find any faults in in any misbehavior or anything like that. No, I, I really liked it. It sounded great. Um, and it's one that, let's say you get like, let's say you have somebody in your house that gets a little crazy and likes to crank everything up all the way, right? This can take it, right? This is not going to die, right? If you like, if you crank it up all the way or something or if, or if you just want to like watch a movie or full blast or something well it might not be you know it might 
compress the response a little bit, but it's not going to, it's not going to make any, you know, crazy noises that sounds like it's coughing up blood, like another other <laughs> subs might, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's a good sub. I say get get one, get two. You can turn it up. It, it, it can All right, it. just so you know, I just found the sentence in your review because I knew I I wasn't sure if I was going full crazy or not. And I'm gonna put I'm gonna put the quote here. This is from James Larson's review review quote about the driver material and the dust cup and all that stuff. So according to James, it's a Kevlar reinforced paper cone with an anodized aluminum dust cap. So I don't think the whole cone is aluminum. So no, the, the, the dust cap would be, but the dust cap covers the entire, like you could see the, the surround adhesive is on the dust cap. So the dust cap covers the entire cone. There we the go. cone, the cone is the part that's affixed to the, um, the uh, former for the voice coil. So yeah, oh, that's, okay. and, and you know, I'm sure this is right because RSL has read the review and they didn't say that this is incorrect. So, <laughs> you know, right. the, the, I, this is that would be correct for sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, that answers that question. Um, they're asking about the warranty. I thought it was three year. Three years, I believe. Three yeah. Years. Yeah, I think three years. Uh, I, I think, think the only subwoofer that I know uh, that sells direct that gives you like a 10 year on the driver is Arendel Sound. Arendel, yeah. Ten, well, a lot of places, places can give you long warranties on the driver because that's not a normal point of failure after, you know, yeah. it's either it's either going to fail right away or it's just not going to fail. And so it's the, the amplifier is what the warranty is all about on the subwoofers, as, as you know. Yep. So the SVS is five years, of, they're saying. Okay. So, I mean, there's pros and cons. I mean, here, the bottom line is we're bringing you guys some incredible products on this channel, whether it's SVS. Arundel Sound, you know, RSL speakers, RBH, Paralisten. I mean, we've covered the whole gamut from entry level to the high end. We try to give you guys the best products that we find. Otherwise, we just we just don't want to waste our time on poor performers. And the RSL is is obviously king of the hill in its price class. It is really an impressive product. So I think that pretty much wraps this up. Um, I won't stay too long with you guys here. I know you got everyone's getting ready for the 4th of July. I hope everybody has a safe, fun, and happy holiday. James, thanks for coming on our YouTube channel to drop your knowledge on this subwoofer. Don't forget to read the review on audioholics.com. I'll link the review in the, in the link below on the description. And there's a link there. I know there's a back order on the subwoofer right now, but I, they claim they're getting them in stock really soon. So you guys, if you're Ready to pull the trigger, maybe wait another week or so. And uh, I'm telling you, it's worth the wait if you could do it. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to us if you want to suggest video topics or ask questions. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.